Okay, now you should be able to hear something because while I was fixing some of my bug issues, I forgot to turn my monitor, uh, my audio monitoring off. All right, so let's start again. Can you hear me now? Just gonna wait a second. Okay, good. Uh, I recently had to fix some bug issues with my computer, one of it being that the GPU had died. So when I was attempting to stream in the past, what had happened was that since my GPU was dead, it was forcing all of the encoding on the CPU, which was also trying to handle the streaming or the actual uh, visuals of what was going on with the computer. And that overload was causing a lot of uh, quality issues. Uh, so I recently fixed my computer by sticking it in the oven at 385 for like eight minutes and then just put it all back together. And what that did was that took the solder, all that solder that was between my GPU and my laptop that had uh, crackled and broken or whatever problem that could potentially have been there. It re uh, remelted those, those solder joints and then let them cool and essentially remake those connections uh, between the GPU and the computer, and that worked perfectly fine. And now, as you can see, I'm streaming at uh, 1080p, and my CPU, instead of being at like 90, 99% utilization, it's sitting at like 3% right now. So uh, a lot of things have gotten a whole lot better. Uh, additionally, I got some cool lighting, uh, like full-on photography slash videography quality lighting. I got them at the University of Michigan's Property Disposition Center, and I got, I looked online at uh, eBay and stuff. It's like over $1,500 worth of equipment I got for $75. So I got these awesome lights. Um, they're warm, which is good because the office is really cold right now. Okay, now to introduce the content again, since you guys didn't hear me in the beginning. Uh, we'll be covering hidden Markov models, but a little bit more expansive than the last time that we talked about HMMs or the last time that we did virtual office hours. Um, mainly because the last one was focusing on the Viterbi algorithm, and that's fun and all, and it's super helpful in getting a specific set of information out of an HMM. Uh, but we've had some questions offline uh, with regards to the class that I'm co-teaching, uh, Bioinformatics 529, Bioinformatic Concepts and Algorithms. Anyways, some of the students had asked, uh, get a little bit more insight into the forward, back, uh, forward algorithm, backward algorithm, and the forward backward algorithm. And then more importantly, I wanted to cover my implementation of the Baum-Welch algorithm that the class was recently tested on. And I'm just trying to focus or clear, maybe clear up some of the logic behind some of the steps that were, we were expecting students to overcome. We are tremendously happy with, or tremendously pleased with how well the students actually performed on this exam. Since this is still a class that is currently being constructed, we've really been trying to use this, or we didn't really want this, but the first exam ended up being our litmus test to figure out how we're doing in the class as a whole and how we're actually getting to the students. Yes, the students hated the exam, whatever, but the students also shown that they understand the material and that's super important for us. Okay, so uh, first I'm just gonna open this up with any questions and I'll just watch chat here uh, while I talk about some of the background that we'll be covering today. Uh, the first portion of this is uh, hidden Markov models are great for identifying uh, particular states that uh, a set of sequences, observed sequences, could have. Now, there's lots of different examples of hidden Markov models out there. A lot of times this is with relation to uh, probability uh, games like uh, gambling, uh, weighted dice, or unfair casino stuff. The last time we chatted, I talked about the idea of uh, colorblindness in the, in the scope of there is a, a company, the M&M &M Mars, uh, sorry, Mars Candy Company is trying to remove certain colors out of their M&M setup for specific focus groups. And a string of men will come up and grab 
uh, the candy, depending on whether or not that's the color that needs to be removed. And if we're talking about brown, that's fine. You should expect that anytime an M&M is on the conveyor belt, anybody would see that as brown and remove it. However, when we start talking about uh, reds, oranges, greens, depending on specific color blindness, uh, we can actually say, we don't know for sure that this is a 100% likely event. It is very possible that somebody would be removing a candy that actually isn't the color based off of them having a specific type of color blindness. That's kind of like a real world exam example, stretched to the extreme, obviously. But the uh, importance of this is, is all the manager of the company would know is the sequence of M&Ms and, and what the uh, people in line chose to either remove or take or, or leave, I should say. So remove the M&M or, or uh, leave the M&M. And based off this, they can make some assumptions like uh, what is the uh, demo or not demographics? What, what's the distribution of specific colors of M&Ms within this these types of M&Ms? And with all these known variables, they can make some inferences about what the makeup of the sequence of men are. So the, the CEO could technically go back and look and go, the, this group of people or this person is likely to be colorblind based off of our observations. That's what the Viterbi algorithm is. The Viterbi algorithm says, based off of a certain set, set of sequences, we're going to figure out what the hidden state is, what the, the sequence of hidden states are. Um, the forward algorithm is... Uh, we're just going to go and process through, whoops, sorry, we're going to process this sequence of events and we're going to figure out what is the probability of that sequence happening given a specific state. Now, this could be whether or not the person's colorblind. Uh, so we're going to go through each of these men in this colorblind thing that I'm talking about, the M&Ms. Each of these men are going to go through and we're going to say, what is the probability of this person being colorblind versus not colorblind, and then step over to the next one. Now, uh, that'll give us the forward probability of the sequence. The other side is the uh, backward algorithm, or reverse, whatever way you wanna talk about it. And the idea there is to do the same thing as the forward algorithm, but go in reverse. And the big confusion here is if we have one, why do we need the other? And that's because stats is fun and they like just doing lots of stuff. Uh, in all actuality, the reality is that they, we take the forward algorithm and backward algorithm, and yes, the probabilities of the, any given sequence uh, for the forward algorithm and the backward algorithm, the complete probability should be the same or near identical to each other uh, towards the tail end. However, when you combine them together, you actually get this uh, posterior probability. Now, this is all just stats talk, and all this is saying is, for this given position, for this specific state, we're going to find the mar we're going to take these marginal probability, or we're going to determine the marginal probabilities of this specific uh, sequence being this specific state at this specific spot. All, all sorts of fun stat stuff. The forward-backward algorithm is just essentially the forward algorithm multiplied by the backward algorithm. Uh, Maybe I should give you guys a, a data structure visual, visualization first. Um, I'm going to jump over to Jupyter Lab and we'll look at just some silly data structure. So the first thing I'm going to do is just import uh, NumPy as NP. And if we want to think of, of a really silly data structure for what the forward algorithm and backward algorith algorithm produce, uh, in class we always talked about a list of dictionaries. However, I think it more appropriate to think of a, a, a two-dimensional list. And the idea being, if I go np dot uh, zeros, and then let's just give it some size. And I'm, I'm just gonna say it's two rows and I don't know, 10 columns. So this is the idea of what the forward backer, backward algorithm produces, the forward or backward algorithm produces. It should create, let's say this top row is the potential of somebody being colorblind, and the bottom row is the potential of somebody being not colorblind. 
And then each position along the x-axis is actually the sequence of events. So this person, uh, and then it'll give the probability. So this, this probability will be the probability that this person is colorblind, and this would be the probability that this, that this person is not colorblind. And it'll go through this. Um, so when we think about the uh, forward-backward algorithm, the fun part about this is it's essentially the same thing. I'm going to say forward equals np dot random dot randint, and I don't know, 10, 100, and let's give it uh, let's say 2 by 20. And now if I look at this, you'll see that this is two rows and there's like 20 observations. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with the backward algorithm. And again, I'm just making up some fake numbers here. Uh, we look at the backward algorithm. This is what the output of the backward algorithm would be uh, besides this probability of these two things happening. I'm, again, these are just fake numbers. Don't don't actually hold me to this. The idea of the forward al forward backward algorithm is essentially we can take f and multiply it by b and then divide by some probability. It could be whatever we want. And I'm just going to say uh, np.mean f. And what this will do is NumPy will be super helpful for us in taking element-wise by element-wise multiplication. And this is the, would actually be in the context of hidden Markov models. This operation right here, this element-wise operation, is essentially what the forward-backward algorithm does. It gives us these posterior probabilities. Okay, uh, enough of that. Let's actually get into some of the content. I'm going to bring in some fun imports. Let me just delete some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to bring in some fun imports that'll help us in the long run and you'll see it in the end. And I'm just going to actually just copy and paste from my notes. Um, so the first one obviously is going to be NumPy. And then I separately import NumPy random uh, just because it makes it easier for me to call uh, some of the random functions uh, without having to type numpy.random or np.random. And then I use pandas here, and now my initial gut check or my initial knee-jerk reaction to tackling the HMM was actually to use pandas and leverage this ability of uh, Pyth of NumPy and pandas being able to m easily multiply uh, element-wise uh, computations, multiply or add, subtract, whatever mathematical operation I could do element-wise with pandas. The problem with this is, is one of the good traits of a hidden Markov model is called the uh, Markov characteristic. And the idea of that is, or a trait, or whatever you want to call it, is that it's essentially memoryless. It's going to look a little ahead, but it's going to forget everything behind it. So uh, this is super helpful in computing for computing purposes because we, our, our, data, our data structure, our data space is very, very minimal. However, when we start uh, when we start dealing with things with pandas or NumPy, it's like instead of using a hammer, you're using a tractor. It's just a lot of work. Uh, it's doing a lot of work for a little bit of little bit of effort, um, or it's a lot of startup, a lot of overhead to just do a little bit of work at each time. So while I did the full Im implementation of the HMM using pandas. Because it does lots of little steps, every single time it implements or re-implements or, or restarts up, respins up a, a, uh, a matrix for the next step, that there, all that overhead built up and built up, and where instead of taking uh, nanoseconds to do computations, it was taking milliseconds on up. And if we're getting into the bomb Welsh where I'm doing things repeatedly, that really piled up as far as uh, computational efficiency is concerned. So I'm actually just taking a step out of out of that and helping, uh, or I'm using pandas specifically for its uh, from dict method we'll talk about later. And the idea here is I'm going to be working with some dictionaries 
And what Pandas can do is it can build a data frame directly from a dictionary if it's well formed. So it's easily, easily, uh, easy one liner. And then I can just say from that, I'm going to check it versus another. And we'll get to this later in the future. The next part is probably one of my newest friends in the world of uh, Python. Uh, you sparingly, product can be an extremely, extremely powerful uh, iterator. And uh, when we see this in action, let's just see what product does. It just gives the Cartesian product. So if I say for IJ and product uh, ACGT and GI, and then I print each of those, print i, j. What this does is it'll go from a and then give me both g and t. Oh, I guess that was an i. It'll give me a versus g and a versus i and then c versus g. It'll do the Cartesian product, so all versus all. Super helpful. And if you're using it in the right context, it can be super powerful or, or uh, help you really condense your nested for loops into one single line. Now, the danger of using product is that this will give us all possible combinations. Uh, the issue with this is, is what if we don't want all possible com combinations? We only want to see, we only want the com combinations that are observed. So that's something to be careful here is this could be potentially really large if you don't uh, take into account some of these things. But when we're talking with regards to HMMs, we're only worried about the alphabet and the states and then the sequence itself, or, or at least the length of the sequence. So we're not actually going to be getting tremendous overhead here in dealing with product. But it's been my new favorite little baby in Python uh, once I've really started tackling how to use it. Another thing I use here is from the copy library uh, called Deep Copy. And what this does is if I were just to copy uh, a list of lists, uh, the idea being is that if I say A equals a list of one, two, three, and four, five, six, uh, I'm, I'm gonna really kind of stretch some of the limits here. But if I just have A as this, and I say B equals, uh, let's, let's import just regular copy, or copy, and then say B equals copy dot copy, of A, B is still perfectly fine. It's, it's a copy of A. However, the problem can be, and let's see if I can replicate this, this is the problem with the live, uh, live demo. If I say A zero, uh, so I'm gonna go to this first row, and the second item is equal to three, A should show that where it says A three three. And the problem here is even though that co uh, I copied A, into B, uh, it's at this point, it's just a shallow copy. So it's only copying the next layer and then all the references to it. Uh, deep copy is something special in that it'll recursively go through all of the, uh, all of the items that is contained within whatever it's copying and actually copy the value. So it's, if we did the same thing here, uh, where I'm instead of uh, B just being a regular copy and I make B a deep copy of A and I look, whoops, and I look at A, there's my A, B is gonna look the same because it's a regular copy. But if I go to that same thing and say A02 is equal to five, okay? And then I look at A, you see that I've changed that five, but if I look at B now, since I did a deep copy, it actually doesn't copy the reference, it copies the value itself. Um, and the reason I do this is deep copy is super helpful in uh, creating uh, identical copies of a specific state. And with regard to the Bomb Welch uh, algorithm, it's important that if we're going to look for convergence that we keep some previous states. So I can just say deep copy on whatever object I'm using and then check it after updates. Um, and then the last one here is array. And uh, in the class or in 529, and a lot of people's first initial reaction to do uh, is to deal with uh, just regular lists or a list of dictionaries or a dictionary of lists, however way you want to think about it. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly valid. 
I'm always thinking in the bioinformatic realm, one of the key aspects that we have to consider is what happens. I want to bring up chat for a second because I can't see any. Okay. Uh, the key aspect I want to bring up here is in bioinformatics, what happens in the scale gets larger and we start dealing with really big data. Um, we don't really test these boundaries a whole lot uh, in this specific example, but should you use this HMM, and it's it'll be a fine implementation, but there are better implementations out there, specifically when we start dealing with like the C world, which is so much faster. But with regards to Python, this is fine. So caveat aside, um, I a list actually has some issues. Uh, the list actually has some issues because in Python, a list isn't like pre-allocated when it comes in the memory world of the of the computer. That means when you create a list, it doesn't ever know how big it's going to be or how small it's going to be. So it always kind of sits there in like this limbo of, okay, you're approaching the end of this list. We're going to reallocate some more memory. Oh, you're approaching. We're going to reallocate some memory. So there's this additional overhead of uh, what's going on with the list. Uh, and could potentially, and as much as they're super performant in Python, when we think about on scale, that could be actually uh, a computational nightmare, uh, specifically with memory. The same thing with dictionaries. Dictionaries are super fast lookups. Like it, it's constant time. O of C. It's just a constant time uh, for lookups. The problem with dictionaries in Python is that they can, uh, they like, lists have a significant amount of overhead in creating creating them and generating them and the maintenance of them. So again, when I'm thinking about scale, I want to reduce the number of dictionaries I have, and I want my lists to be as concise as possible. So I use something in the, in the standard library called array. And what array is, is just a super, super uh, optimized array structure that actually do allocation ahead of time and that it'll be that specific size. Um, and then uh, looping through it is tremendously fast. It's almost at C level. Uh, not C as in like the ocean, but C as in the programming language. Okay, so those are my special imports. Uh, I'm additionally going to bring in this uh, block of code. And this is just actually just a quality of life thing that I'm going to be doing. doing. And we'll, I'll talk about this through the steps. I'm doing this try except because I'm attempting to import a special package called UJSON. Um, UJSON is a third party package. And, and if you went into uh, Conda and you just said Conda install UJSON, uh, it would take a second. Um, and then install. It's a third-party package, but the great thing about UJSON is it is a... No, uh, that's actually a super good question. The NumPy array is less efficient when you're dealing with really small data sets, but if you start building your data sets to really, really, really large, um, the NumPy array actually comes out ahead. But that intersect point is actually the big pain here in that what size is sufficient for you to get uh, proper, uh, what size of, of the data set is sufficient for you to get the proper gains out of a uh, NumPy array. Furthermore, array is super optimized. It's in the standard library. You don't need to install anything. It's already in there in Python. It's super fast for iteration. So long as you know what the data structure you're going to be working with, uh, as you can see, my UJSON, I already have it installed. But anyways, so going back to Jupyter Lab, um, the cool thing about an, or I should say, you don't get a lot of the great things of the array uh, that you would get in NumPy, like matrix calculations. However, the great thing about arrays are is you could just dump that array right into NumPy, and NumPy will automatically parse it as a NumPy array, and then you could do whatever you want to it from there. So it's super easy to carry over, um, but I'm just trying to keep within the standard library a little bit. Uh, but that's an excellent question. I would never say less efficient unless you're talking. I would unless you're talking about really small, and then we're just talking computational speed uh, because there's the overhead of setting one up. But once you start working with sufficiently large data sets, 
NumPy is hard to be beat. Um, but anyways, the special thing about UJSON is not only is it more efficient than the standard JSON library that comes with Python, which is, it's great. It does what it's supposed to, uh, but it doesn't do it as well as it could. Um, UJSON is super crazy efficient. Um, but that's not the reason I'm using it here. The reason I'm doing it, using it here is that uh, when I want to jump a uh, dump a JSON, if I, if I try to use the regular json.dumps, I don't have access to this keyword argument called double precision, and that sets my floating point precision. Nothing will irritate old school uh, scientists more than having like 16 uh, numbers past the decimal. Really bad juju for presentation's sake. Anybody that is in University of Michigan's Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics should definitely take me up on uh, these kinds of concepts of controlling for precision, specifically when you guys are going to present, be presenting in which anybody in the, any of the head honchos of the department may be watching. Wink, wink. Anyways, so I'm just using UJSON because it directly exposes this double precision uh, setting, which allows me to set the precision of my floating point numbers. However, if you don't install it, I use this accept error uh, import error, and then I just use the regular JSON library. Now, while our the JSON library would be perfectly fine, the, the only problem is, is there's an additional step, uh, an additional CPU usage of we take the data and we dump it out to JSON format, just like before. However, we need to le uh, load that data back into JSON using this parse float. So every time that the JSON sees uh, an element is a float, it'll perform this operation. And the idea here is I'm saying for whatever the float is, that's what this O stands for, whatever this float is, I wanna take that float and I wanna assign it uh, uh, two decimal points. This, this is the shorthand for string formatting. It's taking that, converting it into a float and then just taking two significant digits and then putting that out. And then we do the final dump step which allows us to uh, dump with or print out our models with a certain number of precision. The last point here is gillifying, and that's just specific to our department. Um, this is making NumPy print out everything up to two decimal points and uh, Pandas printing out everything up to two decimal points. So that's all this is in a nutshell. This cell is, or this uh, cell this, yeah, cell, I keep saying that. This is all just uh, aiding in how the data is represented when the user wants to look at the model. Okay, so let's actually get into this. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of advanced Python here in that I'm going to be using um, inheritance, object-oriented programming here. Uh, we've already kind of done this in the 529 class, but it makes for a lot of scrolling if I don't, if I remove some of this stuff. It makes for a lot of scrolling if I don't remove some of the stuff and abstract it away from the user and just let the actual HMM class handle the, uh, the actual methods we're concerned with. And that's like forward, backward, forward, backward, and bomb Welsh and Viterbi. So I'm gonna take a lot of that housekeeping stuff out of the mix and I'm gonna create uh, another thing I'm going to call base HMM. And all I'm doing with this base HMM is this is what's gonna house all of that uh, maintenance or day-to-day -day stuff. And I'm gonna copy from some notes so I don't have to worry about my doc strings too much, uh, just for the sake of completeness. So the idea of the base, uh, base HMM is it's essentially creating the skeleton in which HMMs are gonna be working off of from here on out. And it's gonna have all of what we expect it to have, alphabet, hidden states, init probs, trans probs, emit probs. Uh, if you are in 529 and you are looking at my implementation versus what was given to you on the exam or what we did in class, it is going to be different. I'm giving you that disclaimer now because, excuse me, not all of the information, not, not all of the structuring was the way I would have done it. So this is just my take on it. Um, 
much like we already did in class, I'm, I'm creating this all. And all this all is saying is when we look in the dictionary, this is what's going to control what the user sees. We don't want to expose a ton of stuff uh, that we don't need to. And now let's actually start our construction, def init self alphabet. And here's something I'm doing different than the class. And I'm going to be saying, I'm just going to be putting in a default alphabet. Just because we're doing a lot of DNA stuff, this just helps me not have to type one more thing later on down the road. Uh, hidden states. And again, I'm setting another default argument of none. Uh, sorry, just making my notes a little bit more visible. Uh, now we'll go into init probs equals none and bring this down and say trans probs equals none, uh, emit probs equals none. Seed, and seed is just for when we're trying to control for some of the randomness of how our hidden Markov models are uh, created. Next, uh, precision is equal to two. Again, I'm just setting my floating point precision. And then lastly, I'm gonna to say tolerance equals one E negative 10, doesn't matter. And the idea of this tolerance step is that I am actually saying, or this tolerance keyword, is that I'm saying, uh, this is the value in which I'm going to be checking for convergence. So one, from one iteration of the bomb welch to the next, this is what I'm saying, this is the threshold where I'm gonna say I'm done. Instead of just going n number of iterations, that could be computationally expensive. The next part is let's set up our floating point numbers. And I'll, I'll yeah, I'll just do my it's here. And here I'm just creating a private variable. Um, and the idea here is I'm not expecting the user to need this directly at any time uh, outside of the initial uh, construction of their HMM. So the user could potentially go back and change this, but I'm just doing this for me. Now let's do our convergence checking. self.tolerance, and again, this is a, a private variable uh, because I don't expect the user to change it after the instantiation of the object as well. Uh, we're gonna do some more, uh, more fun stuff. We need to make sure that the user is actually giving us a valid HMM, and so much as we already have this uh, default alphabet, the only thing that hasn't been supplied is this hidden states. And we can do this, we can check for this just by saying if hidden states is none. And now we're gonna do a, a step in the Python world, a little bit more intermediate Python world, where we're gonna start doing our raising, uh, raising errors, raising exceptions. I'm gonna say raise value error and saying hidden states must be provided. And all this will do is when, if the user tries to use this base HMM class and when they instantiate it, if they don't provide hidden states, it's gonna bump them out with an error. Oops, sorry. It's gonna bump them out with an error and uh, tell them no, no, instead of letting them get down the road and find out nothing's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, self dot hidden states equals Hidden states, self dot alphabet equals alphabet. Okay, now what this looks like I'm doing is I'm assigning these attributes directly. And you'll actually see a little bit more advanced level object oriented programming here in a second um, where I'm actually controlling for some of these later on, specifically the uh, states and whatnot. I'm just kind of getting through all the rest of this stuff. Now, let's actually start dealing with 
uh, setting up our probabilities. And this is making the assumption that the user is going to provide some it or no, sorry, let me, as you were, the user may provide some data or no data at all. And uh, we wanna give them that chance, a fair chance at doing this. So this is a little different than what we saw in class. Uh, and all we're saying is, we're just setting each of these uh, probability matrices as, uh, as whatever the user gave us. And the idea being is if the user chooses not to uh, give us inf any information, to give us any probabilities, we're automatically going to be assigning them this none. So if the user does choose to give us, I don't know, the emission probabilities, we can treat that as a prior to our setup and not actually overwrite them by accident. So this is an additional step that the user can create some priors ahead of time and assign them. So if they only know the emission probabilities or the initiation uh, initial probabilities, this will set them up. If not, it'll set them to none. And now we go through and uh, do our initialize random, and I'm gonna pass it whatever that seed was, or random seed. This is the only time random comes into play. Okay, so uh, hopefully the astute of you may have picked up that I don't have a initialize random function yet. So let's actually do this. Def initialize random self seed. I'm gonna power through some of this stuff because we actually actually gotta get to the algorithms themselves. Selves. So I'm just gonna copy and paste what I have for the code for this function. If that is okay with you guys. And I'll just talk over it real quick. Initialize random. Again, this this leading underscore uh, just signifies that this is a private function, private method, private attribute, whatever it is. And it's not meant for the user to handle directly. That's the only point of that. It doesn't mean they can't use it. It just means they shouldn't. Um, what it's doing is, uh, first we're gonna set our seed and then we're gonna see, did the user already give us the initial probabilities? If not, our initial probabilities are just the number of states and then we're just creating uh, we're just creating those probabilities for the initial states. And then we're using a dictionary comprehension here where we're saying for each of these states in uh, I probabilities. So in this, we're saying this is going to have two states with respect to colorblind, not colorblind, or uh, CPG island versus genome, genome. There's two states. We're saying create two numbers that will sum up to one. That's what this uh, NumPy Dirichlet uh, method does. It'll create n number of numbers that sum up to one. So now we have our states and our probabilities, and I'm going to zip them together so that if it's genome, it'll genome and the first probability will be put together, and then island and the second probability will be put together. And then I'm just wrapping those together into this dictionary and then setting that equal to my init probs. Okay. Second part is if the user didn't provide a transition probability, it's essentially the same thing. And the only special thing about the uh, transition probability is that it is a, a square matrix. So the number of states by the number of states, meaning if I'm in this state, what's the likelihood of me being in, this, in the same state versus going to a different one and then back and forth. Um, so it's a square, totally square matrix. And again, this is just a fun dictionary that I'm just setting up. I'm just saying, here's this transition, uh, zip those things together again, and then I'm just adding a layered uh, probability matrix. This is nothing amazing or anything like that. This is just a simpler way to create uh, randomized initial settings. And the same thing applies to this emission probabilities. So I don't really need to go over this initialize random. Okay, now we're gonna get into the uh, advanced housekeeping issues in Python. And that's where we're gonna start dealing with uh, some of the uh, properties. So the very first one that we'll be doing is this 
uh, init probs. Now you'll see if you look at any of these other cases, like up here, we're saying we're setting init probs equal to something. However, when, when I write this thing saying init probs, and I put it this special decorator here called at property, what this means is we're gonna treat that thing more as an attribute than a function. Because function calls, you need parentheses. This is saying this is an attribute of this class. And then we're just saying, here's this access to a private uh, attribute called initial. Now, when you wanna see the other side of things, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to do the other side of it, because here, this is just saying, what happens when I wanna see the initial probabilities? Now, what about when I want to set the initial probabilities? The second part of this is I say, here we said init probs, and we made that a property. Now we're saying the init probs property, this is how we're gonna define how things are set. So this is when we actually do like emit probs equals something. This is setting it. This is how we're now defining how your program handles that information. So um, we're saying uh, we're going to take those initial probabilities. And if the user gives us none, we're just going to make it none. However, if it's a dictionary, we want to make sure that the sum of everything in there, uh, first, we need to make sure that there's the initial probability is the same length as the number of states we're using, and that they sum of them equal one. This is just protecting the user from themselves. And then we're assigning to this private variable again. You'll see these on the, the two different cases, we're assigning to this private variable. Now, the big idea here is that uh, in, in computer science realm, specifically object-oriented programming, there's the idea of isolation encapsulation you want to put some checks and balances uh, between the user and the data to make sure that the user doesn't unintentionally give us bad data or malformed data that actually can ruin them later on down the pipeline. So the idea here is we're saying this dot, this underscore initial is the gate, th this is the, the, the repository of the data. The, the user using init probs and uh, as a setter and getter, that's the terms here, is that we're putting a gatekeeper in between the user and the data to make sure that they're getting the information that they need and that the information they provide is proper and adequate. So that's why with this init probs, we're checking for the, to make sure it's properly formed. Um, I'm just gonna copy and paste some other ones here uh, just because we don't need to really go over this. You already have a lot of it as is. So these are all the same ideas, uh, emission probabilities, transition probabilities. And the idea here is, again, we're just checking to see if, if the user gave us a dictionary, we wanna make sure that the dictionary is a square matrix. So we're checking to see if the length of the uh, dictionary is the same length as the number of states. And then we check to see uh, if the transpose, or not the transpose, if the interior, the next item of the dictionary, um, whatever it is, is the same length. So again, this is just us making sure that they're the same sizes. Uh, testing for a square matrix and then making sure the probability is sum to one. And then lastly, the emit probabilities, emission probabilities, we're just checking to make sure that the width of it is the length of the alphabet and then it has is the same number of hidden states and the emission probabilities sum up to one. Okay, the last little bit of housekeeping here is how it actually handles uh, some uh, additional steps. Uh, first, we're saying if the user gives us hidden states, just assign it to this private variable, private attribute called hidden states. And then we're just checking to make sure if it's a string, if the user gives us a string like GI or colorblind, not colorblind, uh, we're just gonna say, okay, that's good, put it in there. Uh, if they gave us a list or a tuple, it's going to join those together and turn it into a string. Uh, in any case, we wanna be dealing with a string. Uh, one of the problems we had with the exam is the uh, initial implementation used sets. And while dictionaries in Python 3.7 are guaranteed to be ordered, sets are not. 
And what was happening was uh, individuals were getting different models because the uh, order was randomized, so to speak, or semi-random. Uh, so by deferring to use strings specifically, we're going to preserve that order no matter what we choose. The next part is the string. This is what happens when we call print on our object. This is the behavior that our object has when we use print. And here we're gonna see that fancy function we used up above, we created up above called to JSON. And this is just what's gonna be dumping out the values of our uh, probabilities. And then lastly, this is what my little trick for dealing with convergence checking is. Uh, because I'm using pandas, um, I can use pandas Sorry, just kind of zoned out there. I can use pandas to take this a dictionary, like this dictionary of initial probabilities of my current object, my current state, and then whatever I'm comparing it to. So this dunder equal means what happens when I say equals equals something. So if I compare a new or my object to something else, if I say this equals equals that, this is the behavior my program has when it sees that equals equals sign. So here I'm using pandas to convert my initial probabilities into a series. And then I'm gonna change this other ones because I'm assuming the person's gonna be comparing another version of this object, specifically for Bomb Welch, um, to itself, its previous self. So I'm turning that one into a series as well. And then using the np numpy all close uh, method, what this does is it'll actually go through the arrays and check the arrays one by one to make sure element-wise they are all equal to each other within a specific tolerance. So that's that tolerance that we set in the very beginning. Now, if they are all close, then we go to the next step because we're assuming the initial probabilities are the same. But we need to check the complete package. That includes the transition probabilities and the emission probabilities. So here we're saying if NP all close, and then we're using this data frame and we're converting those transition probabilities uh, into data frames and then just doing that. So here I'm just using pandas just for convergence checking. That's it. Instead of having to go through each of the dictionaries one key at a time and then checking all the values, it can be very painful, very long, drawn out. Um, and if all these conditions are true, it returns true saying it is equal, otherwise false. Okay, so that finishes the base HMM. Now we actually get into the real HMM. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna copy and paste some more code. Again, the special part here is I've inherited, I've taken this HMM, this new HMM that's just the formulas, and I'm inheriting everything that the base HMM has. So everything the base HMM can do, this HMM can do. Uh, and if I choose to, I could overwrite some of the things that it does, I'm not going to. I'm treating this as like a, a, as a, as a repository of things that I don't really care about and I'm not gonna be troubleshooting. I can actually just minimize that and never have to scroll through it again, okay? Now, this base HMM, uh, the idea here is we're actually going to be exposing not just these probabilities like they were before, we're actually gonna be adding additional information like the Viterbi, the forward, forward, backward, and backward, and then the bomb welch. So these are all gonna be things that if you say something uh, is in this, in this object, it'll have, act, like if you said DIR on whatever HMM, and we'll see this in a, in a little bit, uh, this'll be what's, what's populated when DIR is called. So if I just do this, um, if I were to say A equals base HMM, and the only thing that I need, since alphabet's already filled in, is hidden states. I'm just gonna say GI. Now if I say DIRA, if we look just at the base HMM, these are the only things that the base HMM had under this all step, this all attribute. It's just the probabilities. And we can look at this, we can check out this, this A, and it'll print out everything just like we've seen normally, and it, produces a random HMM for us. We don't have any algorithms at our disposal yet, but this is what we have. Um, but if we do the same thing with 
just using A as just a regular HMM where I'm inheriting from this. Well, let's look at this again. This is the old A's DIR. And let's call this one B. And I create just a regular uh, HMM. Now, if I say DIR B, you'll see that I have exposed a whole lot more to the user seeing that these are possible things that the user can type. Um, typo in there. This shouldn't be Welch. It should be underscore Welch instead of hyphen Welch. So hopefully that makes sense. All this is is just clearing up the information that the user actually sees when they're interrogating some of these data structures. All right, now getting the doc strings out of the way, doing this for you guys. We're gonna go right into the forward algorithm. And the forward algorithm calculates the probability of a sequence uh, given an HMM. Um, so there's two things that we expect out of the out of the forward algorithm. This is the probability of the sequence using the algorithm, and then this dict of array of floats. And this is the forward matrix of probabilities of given bases. So at a specific spot, what is the probability via the forward algorithm at this position for these states? Um, Yes, depending on what the class is. Uh, if you, all wrapper does, it, it, I'll actually do this. We've already defined what the string is. Let, let's look at the wrapper uh, since Wayne was talking about that. Wrapper stands for the representation of this class and it's a slightly nuanced version of what string does or str. Um, and I'm just gonna say return 42 whatever. It has to return a string. It always has to return a string. Um, and then I'm going to make this pass so that my code doesn't blow up on me. So if, if I do this wrapper, the difference here is we already have B equals HMM hidden states GI. Okay. The string method allows us to say what happens when we call print on the object like this. The wrapper method, the special thing about wrapper is what happens when I just type the thing itself. And that's what the wrapper method controls for. Now, the idea of the, or what's the reason for wrapper is that uh, the nuance between string and not string is that if I call the object itself like this, the output of it should be possible for me to copy, like just copy the string output and paste it into a Python interpreter and it'd be able to recreate the same object. That's all wrapper does. It's just a representation of the data. It's slightly nuanced. You don't really generally need it unless you're doing something very specific like for the, uh, for clustering, uh, UPGMA where we're dealing with trees and stuff. It is, it makes a very good, uh, there's a very good reason to have wrapper versus string, uh, but we'll get into that tomorrow. Yeah, and that's the sneak peek. We're going to be going over the UPGMA and initialization or uh, implementing UPGMA in Python uh, a little bit more uh, concise than we did in class. Okay, so here is the first part of the forward algorithm that I implement. Now, this should work one-on-one, -on -one, one in one with the way that was provided to the 529 students. The idea here is I'm gonna go through all of the hidden states and I'm creating an array. Now, an array, it takes a specific like identifier. So let's look at that real quick. If I look at array, it tells us what is this type code. And type code is us telling in C language, like here's in Python, we're saying this is the type code and it refers to some type of data structure in, in C. So I'm saying it's a D, so I'm expecting it to be a floating point number, a double, D for double. So I'm expecting a double length floating point number. That's all. And the reason it, I have to tell it is that it's going to allocate this number 
this many uh, instances of that number within the array. So here I can say array and I want it to be a byte. And uh, for anybody that doesn't know, you can shorthand a list and really create a quick list by saying whatever. And this will create me a, a list of nine items that are all the same as the first, whatever. I can do that here by saying B array, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. And this will create an array, and all of these are going to be Bs. So if we look here, B is just a signed integer, just a one byte, so eight bit integer. It could be negative or positive, doesn't matter. Um, so this is probably one of the, or this is one of the smallest structures you can actually create uh, using array. And the idea here is I'm saying, I wanna take that length of the sequence that we're given and I wanna create positions along here, uh, one for each of them. Now, I'm gonna show you why I did it this way uh, real quick. If we were to say some sequence, I, I don't know, pull it up. Um, no, wrong one. Keep on grabbing the wrong one. Exam. This is the exam we dealt with. I'm just gonna pull out some information here so I don't have to deal with it. Take the sequence somewhere. I'm gonna take that sequence and put it right here. Um, given some sequence that we have, I can say uh, the same thing that we had in class, where if I say A equals, and I want to create a list of dictionaries, and I will say uh, state, and I don't know, uh, mp.rand, sorry, nr.rand. Actually, I don't care. Seven. Doesn't matter. Uh, state seven. Uh, for state in, or sorry, for I in range len sequence. Uh, and then I'm going to be taking this product. Or not the product, or product in, or for state in I. So if we look at A, this is like what we had in class. Oops, maybe that was wrong. For I in range len sequence. So we're going to go the full length of the sequence. And I want to create a dictionary. So I'm going to say for state in GI. Create a dictionary comprehension here where I'm going to say state and I. So if we, oops, if we look at this, in class, this is what we've dealt with, was a list of dictionaries. This is what was expected. However, let's kind of look at this in a computer science kind of way. And let's say from sys import get size of. And this is just gonna give us a very shallow look at what the size of this object is that we created. Here we're saying it's 912. Now, if I do the same thing here, where I say for state in GI, and now I'm gonna create a, an array, I'm gonna say state, and then I'm just gonna create an array, array of whatever it's gonna be, D. I can create it B, doesn't matter what it is. I'm gonna say D for the sake of what are class will be going over. Zero times len sequence. Go. 
what this is going to do is create, let's call this B. This is going to create a list, a, a two row list of arrays where, or two, two item dictionary of arrays. And here I'm going to say get size of uh, B. And you'll see that it's significantly smaller than the dictionary. So, or the list of dictionaries. So the idea is as the sequence gets longer, that size is gonna get larger and larger and larger and larger. And I wanna reduce that as much as possible. So instead of creating multiple dictionaries, I'm just creating a dictionary of two, uh, two keys or n number of states, whatever it is, by that many uh, arrays. I hope that kind of makes sense. Okay, so besides all that fun explanation there, I'm creating this forward array. Now, since the forward algorithm starts at the beginning, we have to, assume, we have to look at the very first emission of the sequence as our starting point. So I'm gonna say uh, for state in self dot hidden states. And again, I'm just constantly queuing up or querying that hidden state. And I'm saying when the, in those hidden states, I'm going to say forward, because I'm looking at this, uh, this dictionary of arrays, and I'm gonna, I wanna look at that specific state. And then I wanna say the very first position, zero with item is the very first position. And I'm gonna set that equal to self dot init probs, there we go, init probs by the state. Because remember, our init probs are saying, what is the uh, probability of us being in this specific state versus this, this other one? So, uh, and not stats talk, what is the likelihood of the person in this colorblind line being colorblind versus not colorblind? Or what is the likelihood of the very first thing that we see being a genome versus CPG island? Okay. So we're going to take that initialization or that initial probability and we need to um multiply that by the uh emission probability or emission probs given the specific state we're looking at our current state and then sequence 0 so the very very first item of the list that's in in the case of our uh our problem this is a nucleotide what nucleotide or emission is this? And what is the likelihood that that emission or what's the probability of that emission being seen in this specific state? That makes sense? I'm just gonna assume yes until I see otherwise. So this takes care of the very first spot. Now this is the important part of the forward algorithm is looking at that very first segment. Uh, or, and once you have that, we actually have something to work off iteratively and we don't have to worry about anything until the end. So let's go through the rest of them. And this is where things start to get interesting. And I'm gonna start playing around with that product that we saw earlier. Uh, mind you, this code will be available on the Office Hours repo. I'll post that in chat, unless somebody on chat wants to post the link to that Office Hours repo in chat. Uh, it should be available at the bottom underneath the live stream. There should be a link to that repo as well. Anyways, uh, I'm gonna start playing around Pay attention to what I'm doing with these products. They might be a little weird at first, but once you get your head around them, they're actually super helpful. So for seek index, next state in product range one, because remember I've already, thank you, Emily. I've already looked at the very first emission, so I don't care about the rest of it or care about that first one anymore. I want to start at the, the next one for uh, a range length sequence, whoops, and uh, self dot hidden states. So the idea here is that it's going to take each of these sections, and, and let's look at this in real time, for i, j, in product, um, range one, len, sequence, uh, GI. So let's see this happen in real time. What is the output of this gonna be? So it's saying at that very first position, 
I'm going to go across both states. Second position, going to go across both states. Third position, go across both states. So this is a really concise way of instead of saying, um, this is an alternative for say, instead of saying for I in range len one sequence for state in GI print I state. These will both accomplish the same exact thing. I'm just putting it into a much smaller form. Now this doesn't look like much because these are just two lines, but when you start getting into some of these convoluted for loops where you're trying to keep track of where you're at, it can help. Uh, I'm also a slave to minimizing my line count as possible, as much as possible. Uh, so this causes some issues for readability in the future, um, but I like to think that I'm clever and I'm gonna kick myself later when I try to debug some of this stuff and I'm trying to figure things out. Okay, so I've already dealt with the first state. So since the forward algorithm just takes the sum of across each state, all, all states, that's all I'm going to be doing for these next couple parts. So I have to say uh, for cur state in, and again, I'm gonna play around self.hidden states. Because I have to look, again, remember when I said forward algorithm is saying, given this state, I'm going to sum across what's the transition probability across both states at that state. Again, that's me saying states a lot, but it makes sense when you look at it in the scheme of a table. But I'm going to go across both of those hidden states within this other outer loop of hidden states. And I'm going to say um, forward, and I have to say what is my next state? Because... Remember, the forward algorithm is always looking forward. So what's my next state uh, in mind? In the next state that I'm looking at, uh, I want to take that seek index. So the index I'm at, because remember, the index is the, the array is the same length as the sequence. So the seek index is telling me at what position along the array I'm starting at. Uh, this is going to, I'm just going to sum up these uh, forward cur state and seek index minus one. So here's the special part of that Ford algorithm. So I have to look at the previous state that I, or previous index that I've already done to fill out the next uh, part of the uh, matrix. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the transition probability because remember, we're dealing with states here, state versus state. So we need to do the transprobs. And we want to look at the current state versus the next state. Okay, so now that I have the uh, current state done, I've already got. I've already summed across, summed up across all the states for the each individual space, each individual uh, index position. Now we bring it together and say forward next state and seek index equals. And I'm going to do a little bit of math mumbo jumbo here because uh, I don't feel like writing an extremely long line. So if I wrap things in this parenthesis, I can actually break mathematical operations into multiple lines. Oops. I can break mathematical operations into multiple lines. So self dot emit probs, because now I already have the state, the transition probabilities. Now I need to take into account the emission probability of that specific uh, nucleotide at that position. So I'm going to take that emission probability given the next state and uh, the sequence specific to, or the base specific to that specific seek ind index. And now this is where I'm going to break it down instead of creating a big long line, just multiply. I'm going to multiply that by the forward probability or the forward of the next state at the current seek index. So this is taking the transition probabilities and then applying them to the uh, emission probabilities all in one state an all in one line. So uh, this first line, this line 39, was just finding out the transition step. So we have to sum up across the transitions. But there is an emission at that specific uh, point along the sequence. 
So this emission prob now we take that emission probability and multiply it by that transition probability, and that'll give us our uh, forward probability. Okay, uh, now that we're done with this, we just need to sum up the very final end because because of the way that this iterates, it'll go from the beginning of the sequence all the way to the end. So now we need to get the forward algorithm or the forward probability. And the way to do that, I'm just gonna say forward prob equals, and I'm just gonna sum across that array um, for both states, right? So I'm gonna say forward and I'm state. And I just wanna take that final cell, the final item that I've done across both states. So I'm gonna say for state, in self dot hidden states. And the idea here is it's gonna look at the very final array, the very final column of the array. It's gonna sum the top and the bottom together right here. That's all this is, is I'm taking, I'm going across both states and summing them together. And that gives us our uh, forward probability. So, oops, and now I'm just gonna return that forward probability and the forward matrix. It's a lot of talking for something you guys already have. So um, for the sake of time, I can say with some hand waviness that the backward algorithm is the same exact thing as the forward algorithm. So I'm just going to paste the backward algorithm here again uh, and then just talk over it so I don't have to sit here and type in front of you guys. Again, we're doing the same thing where we're creating both states. Think of this as a two row dictionary uh, of arrays. But uh, since the backward algorithm starts at the very end, and if you look at the implementation that was actually used in the exam, uh, what the creator had done was they would repeatedly just insert it into the, into the very beginning of the list and then just pushed everything right, kept pushing things right. Um, that works, it's perfectly fine. However, it's actually computationally intensive to insert into a list. It's not like appending to a list is actually more efficient than inserting into a list because inserting then has to move your references to the right. I hope that makes sense. It's just a lot more computation. So instead of doing that, uh, that uh, recursive insertion step, all I'm doing is uh, create, I, I've already created my array we're going to create an n length, uh, an n or sorry, sequence length iteratable of some f form or fashion. So I've already created it. So I'm going straight to the very back, anyways. And at the very back, I'm going to say it equals to one because much like the forward algorithm, where we had to start with something, that initial step, before we could fill out the rest of the forward array, uh, forward matrix. The same thing applies to the backward matrix where we have to have something before we can work our way in the other direction. So uh, by nature, we just create this back, the very last uh, state, the very last column across both states are set to one. Um, for the same thing, uh, we're just gonna take the recursive Cartesian product. I just do an alias here because this range is really long. It's very long and I don't like making long lines unless I have to. So uh, if we look at this in shorthand, the idea here is what this is going to do is for I in, I'm just gonna print this out. Oops. So this will take that sequence and then count down from the very end all the way until one, stopping at zero. So this is counting in reverse. That's all it does. So this is strengthening the me going backwards through the sequence thing. Now I'm gonna be doing this product where I'm taking that reverse and then the hidden states, much like we already did with the forward. The only fun about this is, is that we can actually take that emission probability. Uh, we could probably do it to the same thing up here in the uh, forward algorithm. I separated out this uh, multiplying by the emission step the next line down here, it applies just the same. No big deal. Um, I'm taking that uh, current state and summing across all those states and that specific emission probability. Did I get that wrong before? No, I didn't too. 
Anyways, and then um, like the forward algorithm, the backward algorithm goes backwards. So instead of looking at the last column of the matrix, we look at the very first column of the matrix and sum those up, and that creates the backward probability. So then we have the backward probability in the forward in the backward matrix. Ah, okay. A lot of work for something you guys already had. Now we get into the forward backward algorithm. Analogous, yes. So if we were to pull up that exam again, and let's just create something real quick uh, where I have that already created. And I look at this forward algorithm, or if we, if you want to look in the reverse, you're talking about the reverse. I'm talking about the forward and the backward are the same. If I look at this, um, the actual matrix itself is essentially a list of dictionaries. So to access a specific thing, you would say, what is the index position I wanna look at? So I'm gonna say four, and then I wanna look at what state, and that'll give me that specific element. The only difference from that and mine is that mine will be reversed. So instead of saying, uh, oops. instead of saying which position and which state, mine would look like that. So I'm saying which state and then which position. It's the only difference. So very analogous, uh, but dramatically saves in, in memory. Um, the last part is the forward-backward algorithm, and I'll actually type through this one instead of copying and pasting. Def forward, backward, and the only thing it needs is the sequence. Now, the difference between, like I said earlier, the difference between forward-backward, the forward algorithm and the, uh, the forward algorithm, backward algorithm, and the forward-backward algorithm is that both of those give us probabilities in a specific direction, um, but when we take them together, those are the marginal. Pro it, those marginal probabilities allow us to, uh, or sorry, it allows us to calculate the marginal probabilities uh, given the HMM. So I'm going to just capture that uh, probability of the forward and the forward algorithm, or the forward forward. Uh, matrix equals self dot forward sequence and then okay sorry about my chat bot not knowing something I'll have to fix it later and then the probability of the backward and the backward equals self dot backward just saying the same word over and over again. okay so uh the general consensus here is that uh, you can just take each of those positions. So we're just going to multiply each index position across each state element-wise by element-wise, multiply those together, and then we're going to scale by whatever the probability of the sequence is. Um, there are different ways that we can do this. If we look at that exam one again, if we look at this, uh, when we look at the, prob the forward algorithm, we've already seen this. And what if I look at the backward algorithm, or was it PF? Oh, I didn't do it. Uh, PR R equals model dot backward sequence. And I'm just taking an abbreviated sequence. If I do that and look at this PR now, you'll see that these are almost, these are almost identical to each other as far as precision is concerned. Uh, a lot of people will just take the forward probability for the scaling or the backward probability for the scaling. I don't know. I haven't really tested it a whole lot outside of my own fun. I just take the um, probability of forward plus the probability of backwards divided by two. 
That way everybody's included and I like inclusivity. So it should give us the same number, but I'm accounting for both directions. There's no statistical proof of this. This is just me being me. So if you don't feel like doing this, you don't have to. Uh, this is just me. So uh, the posterior, I'm just going to do a fancy dictionary comprehension again. And I'm going to say state, and then I'm going to take that array. The posterior again, <coughs> the posterior is again going to be a sequence length array. And it's going to be doubles and zero, much like we've already seen uh, in previous iterations. And for state in self dot hidden states. Okay, so now I have my arrays that I'm going to be playing around with. Now I need to go through and actually do the posterior probability. And the posterior probability is just the probability at index i in the forward matrix uh, versus the probability of index i in the backward matrix uh, multiplied by each other uh, across both states. So we can do this by, uh, again, I'm going to be using product for i state in product range len sequence and self dot hidden states. So again, this allows me to traverse across both the sequence index and the states at the same time. And I'm going to say posterior state at i is equal to, and I'm going to take that F matrix, and this is re kind of seeing this in action, Emily, of what you're asking about later, uh, earlier. I'm going to take state i. So I'm actually accessing a specific element of the F matrix and multiplying it by the, uh, I'm saying F matrix instead of retyping, let's do this. Because if you guys are following along with uh, what you guys already have in the exam, I'll just do this as F matrix and B matrix. Matrix uh, times state I. And then finally, I'm dividing by that P across all states. And then returning the posterior. This is all the, the forward backward algorithm does is give this uh, posterior. Uh, that's all, nothing special to it. Now, why this is particularly alluring is that uh, when we get to the bomb welch, we actually have the, uh, the fun of uh, needing both the forward uh, matrix, the backward matrix, and their, and their probabilities. And a lot of people want to use that posterior uh, for their calculations. And that's perfectly, it's perfectly okay. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. The only difference is I have to keep track of these PFs and the PBs uh, in Baum Welch, and we'll see that later in a, in a little bit. Um, and posterior doesn't give, or the forward backward algorithm doesn't give us that probability. I'm sure there's some statistical way to find out uh, or get it from the posterior. I don't like dealing with that, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to do it the hard way. And that's fine because it's perfectly capable. It's like the Durbin method, it works. Okay. Um, I'm not really going to go a whole lot over the Viterbi algorithm. I'm going to get get it out of the way um, now. I'm just going to paste it. It's a little different than what we covered last time, and I'll talk about it real hand wavy. Um, zoom out a little bit. Real hand wavy is that the Viterbi algorithm, I have these nested functions within the Viterbi algorithm, specifically the update probs and the uh, get traceback. These were already kind of present in my previous implementation. I just put these within the Viterbi because the rest of the class doesn't need them. Only the Viterbi algorithm needs them. So I'm just defining them within the Viterbi algorithm. Um, so going through the Viterbi algorithm, I'm taking this trace back and then I'm uh oh sorry, I kind of skipped over. I gotta create my traceback array of my first base of the uh, of that sequence. 
I'm converting everything into log 10 because of underflow issues, uh, fun stuff like that. Now, as like a little bit of behind the scenes insight, I've, uh, I tried to automatically ingest all my data into log space so that I don't have to deal with underflow errors. But one of the essential steps of the bomb welch algorithm is summing probabilities and summing log probabilities uh, is harder than it sounds. There is an algorithm to do it, but it's actually all just actu uh, uh, an approximation. Uh, there's no definitive way of if I've already converted my probabilities to logs, then it's uh, difficult for me to sum them up because remember, summing logs is, summing the log of probability is like multiplying the probabilities by each other. So if I'm summing logs, that's an issue because there, there's no other way to go past that. So in light of that, I only use the Viterbi algorithm for uh, I only use the log space in the Viterbi algorithm because I don't like stats and I don't feel like dealing with that function. Um, so I convert everything into their log 10 and then I send, I just keep track of my previous state or previous step and I pass that to update probabilities. And then the update probabilities, um, it's the same stuff we already covered uh, before in the previous session. So if you feel like it, you can look back on it. I'm not going to waste our time. We got about a half hour. Um, and I don't, I want to really spend that on bomb Welch. Uh, but none of that's really changed outside of the fact that I just nested some functions inside there. Okay. Now let's get to the, uh, true monster that is bomb Welch. Uh, Def bomb Welch. Now, the it, the class was given two different ways, two different descriptions on how to set up bomb Welch, or how to actually perform bomb Welch. And the one that was given in the slideshow, uh, or given in the lecture notes, was super understandable because it's more of a pragmatic approach of just counting the number of times you see something and then finding frequencies based off that. Uh, the issue is there's an inherent flaw in that approach in that uh, the bomb welch has to take into account even the unobserved states as well. So if you go just that one route, it's your model's likely not to converge correctly or at all. Uh, there's a lot of issues there. There's probably smarter ways to do this, but the Durbin way is the way that everybody does it. And I kind of trudge through it too, because it's very uh, statistical and I don't like stats. I just clearly say that right now. I'm not a stats person and it feels like stats, especially when you start looking at the formulas. But when you break it down into more plain English or just plain words, it's a lot more digestible than looking at the formulas themselves. So. Uh, with respect to the class, we're expecting uh, a list of sequences and then some pseudo count. And here I'm just going to make my pseudo count one e. Now the pseudo count is just so that when we start multiplying things, uh, we won't get division by zero errors. That's all the purpose of it is. So I'm going to paste some uh, doc strings just because of time. So here's just an EM algorithm that finds the maximum likelihood uh, estimate of the parameters of an HMM given a set of observed emission sequences. So uh, kind of talking, bringing it back, what was the point of the Viterbi? The Viterbi was for us to uh, discern what the hidden state sequence was or, or the optimum path through a sequence given an HMM. The forward algorithm gives us the probabilities of that specific emission at that specific state or that specific position uh, at, across all states. The backward algorithm is the reverse of that. The forward backward is the posterior probability or the marginal, marginal probabilities of, the, of that state at that position. Now, the bomb welch is the special case that is, if the user does not know what those probabilities are, because all those other portions, all those other part, parts of the code, all the other algorithms, 
are defined by needing those initial probability or those probability matrices, the initial probability, the emission probability, and the transition probability. Um, so the bomb welch's purpose is if those are not known, how can we uh, estimate those or at least come up with some sensible defaults? And that's what the bomb welch algorithm does is it identifies those to the best of its ability. Sometimes it gets stuck in some local minima issues um, and your model doesn't converge depending on like, and we'll see here, depending on what the random seed is, stuff like that. Um, the very first part of the bomb welch every time is we have to, the bomb welch is iterative, iterative, meaning uh, it's going to go through one cycle and then it's going to repeat until some condition is met. And that's our convergence condition. And that was set by our tolerance previously stated. So the very first step of the bomb welch every time is to initialize some blank matrices, some, some things that we're going to be keeping track of and updating and then using, using those, that information inform our model and then start over again. So I'm going to create this little def in it bomb welch function. And, and again, this is nested um, because it's only appropriate for the bomb welch function. Uh, the rest of the class doesn't need it. But the bomb welch is going to be using it over and over and over again. So here, I'm just going to create some dictionaries of my fake data, of my pseudo count data. So I'm going to take whatever that pseudo count is for state in self dot hidden states. So here, and this is the parallel that I have, uh, a lot of times when we start dealing with the Durbin method, get these formulaic or algorithmic type ways of looking at things. And even if you look at the exam and bring that up, um, we look at the how the exam's written as far as the bomb welch algorithm. And uh, it starts talking, or sorry, All the matrices are like A, E, I. Like I makes sense for initial and E makes sense for emission. But A, what, what is A? Oh, that's transition. And then we start talking about sigmas, which are the letters, states or whatever. Very formulaic. I don't like it. It's very algorithmic speak. I just want to be plain English. So here I'm just saying init and that is like our init props. And trans equals and we're just doing another uh dictionary state and then uh an inner one next state uh pseudo count state in self dot hidden states state in self states and then uh, emit is the state again remember we're always thinking two dimensions or two rows and each row is a specific state uh, the state by the letter or whatever you want to call it of the emissions and the pseudo count for letter in self dot alphabet for state in self states. So all this does is create uh, these blank slates for us to work on for our iteration step. And now we just got to return those. And it trans emit. Okay, so uh, we're gonna jump around a little bit uh, back and forth between these nested functions. Like we're already done with this function, this init bw. We're already done with it. Uh, I'm gonna write a little bit on the bomb welch until we get to the next step. And then I'm gonna create another nested function. Um, but I just kinda wanna start plodding away at this. Because uh, there's like three steps that we really have to consider when we're dealing with the bomb welch. So I'm going to have this little flag called converged, and I'm going to set it to false. And then I'm going to say count equals zero. Now, the count isn't really needed. The count is 
and not Count Chocula. <laughs> uh, the count is just for uh, user feedback to see at what point during this did the program actually converge. It's just feedback. That's all. Uh, converged is what's needed. Um, so while not converged. So here we're just saying uh, keep doing this until this flag is changed to true. Now I'm going to say init emit or init trans emit equals init bw and then I'm going to pass it the pseudo count. Now I don't need pseudo count for anything else. Pseudo count's taken care of. I don't need to worry about it anymore. I'm done. And I've already said we're, we've started our bomb welch. We just started. Uh, we've already set up our conversion and everything. And now every time that it goes to the next iteration, it's automatically going to create those initial uh, pseudo count matrices for us. So that part's done. We have to keep track of now, a lot of people want to think that, oh, I can just say posterior posterior, there we go, equals self dot forward backward sequence. And a lot of people would think that this is perfectly appropriate. The only issue with this is, and a lot of students didn't realize on this exam, is that Forward backward takes a specific sequence, one sequence. But what does Bomb Welch need? Bomb Welch expects a list of sequences. So posterior is only going to give you the probabilities for a single, a single uh, sequence at a time. And the problem is, is when we start looking at if, if we were to give you more than one sequence, if more, more than one sequence were fed into the bomb welch, uh, you would need to keep track of the probabilities of each sequence, not just a sequence. So I'm actually going to refrain from using posterior, or the forward backward algorithm whatsoever. And I'm going to just keep track of this with a, uh, an outer denominator called uh, just set to zero. Now let's actually start going through them. So for seek in sequences. Now I'm going to actually process each of those sequences one at a time, and I actually need to start doing dealing with all my other stuff. Now I'm going to put a little ellipses here or a pass here because this is where I'm going to jump into another nested function. I'm going to go up, back up here. And what I'm going to call this function is uh, proc seek. And this is probably the work ho workhorse. This is going to be the workhorse of uh, the bomb welch algorithm. So def proc seek. And what this does is essentially does the uh, expectation uh, step, the expectation uh, step, and the, uh, the expectation and the maximization step all together of the EM algorithm. And the only thing it needs is the outer denominator, the sequence that it's going to be working on, the init, trans, and emit. So we're going to be carrying around these matrices with us while we're doing this and constantly updating them. Now I'm going to paste some uh, doc strings so that I can just easily save this onto the GitHub later. So the very first step here is uh, whatever it gets. The, this outer denominator, the uh, init, trans, and emit, it's going to give back. So it's going to take these um, incremented uh, sum of pro sequence probabilities because it's keeping track of every sequence. So it's going to constantly be updating that outer probability. And it's going to be scaling these uh, transition probabilities. And we'll see this in a little bit. So the very first step is we have to find our uh, P forward and our forward and this is equal to self dot forward seek and then the second one is just a copy and paste of this backward okay so 
um, when we look at this, this looks a lot like what the forward backward algorithm already does. It calls both of them. Oops, for it calls both of them, and then for the sake of me being weird, I'm going to um, uh, append or I'm going to increment that outer denominator by the average of the two probabilities. Now, in a one sequence system, posterior is perfectly fine. But again, I'm going through repeated ones. And since it's easy for me to just get the probabilities directly from these functions, I'm just calling them each time. So instead of doing posterior. Uh, now that I have my outer probability, I start going through the emissions. So for I emissions, whoops, emission in enumerate seek. So the idea with the enumerate is it's going to give me not only the item that I'm iterating through, but then the index of that item. So that gives us our sequence position. And we need that when we're looking at the forward and the backward, because remember the forward and backward are index specific. So here I'm going to say for, and now I'm going to go an extra step and say for state in self dot hidden states. Now, the reason I'm using this one instead of the product is because there's a step along the way where I don't need a uh, state specifically. And again, this is just for brevity's sake. I have a lot of comments in my own code, so it looks like a lot to me, but it's honestly not. Um, so if i equals equals zero, so this means if this is our very first emission that we're seeing, so this tells us that this is the very beginning of the sequence, so we need to deal with the initial probability stuff. I'm going to say init state is, I'm just going to increment that pseudo count the very first time. I'm incrementing the pseudo count and uh, taking the forward algorithm and finding the state at i, so the probability of this emission at this specific state, times the backward at state i. That's all it is to it. I don't actually really have to mess around with the init for a little while until I get to the scaling step later on, uh, or the maximization, the scaling step. Uh, but as far as this is concerned, it's just saying the initial time, we're just only worried about that very, very first emission in the, in the sequence. So we only have to carry about, and remember, i is equal to zero at this time, so we only care about that very first position, okay? Now I start dealing with my emissions, and the emissions are, pro or transition is probably the most difficult to think through, uh, and because of this uh, nested for loop or these nested for loops, it's going to get a little mind blowing to try to keep track of what's going on. Um, so here we're going to have this emit and remember everything is based off of state and then something else. So state and something else. So emit is what emission it is. So this is what base we're looking at. So we're trying to find the, we're going to increment the probability of seeing this base uh, in this specific state by the forward at this specific state at this specific position times the backward. Blew your mind, didn't I? Um, that looks a lot like the line above it. Here we're saying the init, init, uh, initial state, initial probabilities for a specific state is just the forward at that zeroth position times the backward at that zeroth position. Emission is just essentially the same thing. We're saying, what is the probability? And we'll get to the uh, rest of the emission stuff here in a little bit. But we're saying, uh, I want to take that forward and backward and multiply them by each other at the same time. Okay. Now, if I equals equals len seek minus one. And now the trick here, the, the trick of why I'm doing this part is that I, I'm considering that I'm already done with the emission step so far as calculating what I've seen up to this point. Uh, and that's saying, because remember, emissions are saying what specific letter we're looking at. So this specific position is telling us that this specific letter has this probability at this specific state. That's all this step is doing. 
this part is now I'm saying I'm already down with my emissions. I'm dealing with transition. I'm going to move, be moving to transitions. Transitions, when you think about this, is transitions are always looking ahead one. They always have to look ahead one step to see what it could potentially be. Is it going to be changing from colorblind versus not colorblind or uh, otherwise? So um, the idea being is that if we're at the very end of the sequence, minus one, we want to stop looking. We're done because or we're, we want to stop looking with respect to the transitions. Uh, any other time, we just want to consider uh, like a step behind. I want to look ahead by one. And you can't get a transition off of the very last position because it has nothing to transition to. Okay. So then I'm going to say trans emission equals seek. And then I'm going to take that I, that seek index that I've been doing, and I'm going to increment it by one. So now this is my look ahead. I'm going ahead, just one uh, ahead in time. So this prevents me from having to loop through the sequence again later on. I can just do it in the same step. So I'm saving myself a, a for loop by putting it underneath here and just looking ahead one. And uh, now I need to go through the states for next state in self dot hidden states. Okay, so going back here, we're already, we're at this state right here. You can consider this state as our current state. And we're already iterating through that. Now we need to start going through the other states right here, down here, because remember, transition probabilities are uh, state versus state, all states versus all states. So I have to go through all of those. But I can keep this, since I'm already iterating through those states already once, I can just do it again down here and save myself another for loop, which is fun. I like saving myself for loops. Uh, so the trans uh, state for next state. So this is the probability of going to this next state given this current state. And we're just incrementing. Everything here is incrementing. I'm going to do the same uh, math formula stuff where I'm breaking this down into separate lines. So that's why you see this uh, parentheses. I'm going to say forward state i. And now I'm going to start going times uh, self.trans trans probs state given next state times self.emit probs state by mission times backward state and here's the trick i plus one so to give you the gist of what's going on in this uh, this line of code, we're saying at the current position that we're in, current state, the current state, the current position, times the probability, so we're getting the sum uh, for, at a specific state. We're saying at this current state, at this specific position, what is the probability, or multiplying that by the probability, that we're going to transition to the other two states, um, given this specific emission across both states. Because remember, emission is if it's uh, colorblind, or sorry, oh, let's go back to the exam. If the, it's a genome and A in a genome versus A in a CPG island. A's in CPG islands should be drastically reduced with respect to A's in the genome. So here we're saying across both states, that emission across both states, uh, at both at that position, and we're summing those all up, and then we have to look ahead one, because this is transitions. We're always looking ahead at to the next stage. What is that transition? So we're looking there. That's all that is. And then this function will be done by just saying uh, return outer init trans emit. So. All that function does is essentially just doing the adding steps. So we're summing up across this. 
this behemoth. So now that we've uh, we've processed that read, we can just call this directly in here. So I'm going to say outer init trans emit equals proc seek sequence seek, and then I got to give it the did I write that weird? I'm going to change this. I'm going to put seek first instead of outer. Down here. Seek, outer init, trans init. Okay. So we've already processed the read. Now that the read's processed, I can, all the reads are processed. That's, all right. Uh, that's what this does. Now that all the reads are processed, I have the newly modified initial transition and emission probabilities and the continually summed outer denominator. Now, this outer denominator probably isn't going to change much because with respect to what we did with the exam, we just tested it against a single sequence. So that probability is just always going to be the probability of that sequence. But if you were given more than one sequence, you could see how that probability would change. And since we're constantly summing up the probabilities for these all these sequences given this specific model, uh, we have to, at some point, divide that whole averaging thing. We have to divide, we have to scale that back because we've done all these sums. So, because uh, if we don't, then our probabilities are not from zero to one. So, uh, we've taken this and now we do need to do that scaling step. So, init trans emit equals and now we're going to get into the last of the nested functions pass it this outer init trans emit okay so we're going to start this function called the scale step now if you're kind of getting all confused about these nested functions the idea here is in the realm of programming you don't want the function, you want a function to do a single job. And if we, if you look at this in the realm of everything, we have one, one job that initializes everything. We have another job that processes everything. We have another job that scales everything. And then we have the final job of updating. Uh, I didn't want that all into one giant function. So I've separated them out into smaller functions. So that way the bomb Welch function, the specific of bomb Welch, its only job is to curate how these other uh, functions work together and then up, make the update. That's all, that's all it does. Um, so I know you might get a little confused about these uh, scale step or these, um, these other functions that I have, but there's a reason for it. So it's gonna take outer and it trans it, copy. doc strings. And all this is doing is scaling all the probabilities. That's all. So we just have to, the scaling is just saying we need to go through each of the probability matrices that we have and divide each of those summed probabilities up to this point by that outer denominator. So it's just a matter of traversing them. And it's actually simpler than you would think. So for state in self dot Hidden states, our good old friend. Um, in it state divide equals by the outer. Now this is an assignment operator, much like incrementing. We're saying instead of plus equals, we're saying divide equals. So we're just dividing it uh, each of these things by the outer denominator instead of typing. Instead of typing init state oops, divided by outer. It's actually more efficient in Python world to use assignment operators because then it prevents an additional lookup. And since we're going through all the states, I'm going to say for letter in self dot alphabet. And then emit because emissions are based off of letters or whatever our alphabet is for state and letter. And again, divide equals by the outer. 
and then for state next state in self dot in states trans state state divide equals so that scaling step is done the last part is uh, the averaging by the values. Um, and this is actually super easy. I'm going to do this to uh, reduce some computation. So I'm going to do some summing ahead of time. So I'm going to say init sum. So I'm going to sum up all the values of the initial probability matrix that we've seen up till now. I'm going to say init.values. And now the emit sum equals state sum emit state values for state cell states. So I'm going through each of the states and summing up all of the probabilities across all the letters for that specific state. And uh, the same thing applies to the trans. I'm gonna change some names here. And it'll go across all those states as well. So now that I've done these sums, I only have to do them once. That's good. Um, now I need to actually apply those so for so a lot like we've already seen up here, um, I could actually just copy and paste a lot of this. What we already saw up here, I can now say instead of outer, I'm going to say init sum. And then here across which state, I'm going to say emit sum given that specific state. And then uh, trans sum given that specific state. And now that's done, we can say return init trans init. Oh. Okay, so that's a lot of work, but now we've scaled everything. Uh, now we've scaled everything. The last part we have to do is now check for convergence. So I'm gonna say old, and this is where we're gonna use deep copy. And I can just deep copy myself. So this keeps like a snapshot of where I'm at right now. And now I'm going to update everything. So self dot emit probs equals, well, let's do it in order. Init probs equals init. Oh. oh, it does this sometimes. Um, just give me a second. This. Oops. It's supposed to. Uh, Wayne, it's supposed to not clear my progress every time because if you look at this, um, I gotta let's see if it works. Um, it's supposed to, uh, that's one of the initialization steps of it. You're just supposed to start with the blank slate and then based off of what the sequence is showing you, uh, update the values. And that's where, cause remember the, if we look at this, the processing, this forward and backward, uh, algorithms are essentially the biggest, uh, components to the uh, calculation of, or the estimation of these results. And since forward and backward rely intrinsically, if we look up at these, forward and backward rely on the 
the transition probabilities and emission probabilities at a specific point in time. So we're saying that with the bomb Welch, we're saying at this specific time, our model predicts that the, this is the probabilities at this, at this moment. And then based off of our model's particular probabilities at this moment, we're going to do some updating to see if there's anything messed up with it. And then we reinitialize with these blank zeros. So this init BW, all it's doing is just creating a blank slate for us to keep tallies of things. We're actually not overwriting. And this is one thing I, I was initially confused about. We're not actually overwriting the probabilities of our model at this time. We're taking our model at this time and uh, updating them or modifying them based off of new information or information from a different perspective. So these aren't actually, while these are heavily influenced, like right now they look like zeros when init BW is called. But because of Proxseq, we take our, our probabilities uh, based off of our model's current snapshot and then update that sna snapshot with the new view. So you're not really getting rid of anything, you're just updating, you're just fine tuning things uh, by init BW. Um, init probabilities, there we go, self dot, I hope that answers your question. Emit probs, does that answer your question, Wayne? Self dot emit equals init. And then the last step is just checking for our convergence uh, count plus equals one, because remember, this is going to happen every iteration. So this is the very first iteration. I want to increment that count by one. This is just for feedback. And now if self equals equals old. So remember, our old is this copy of our self before the update. And then this equals equals, if we look back up here, this equals equals is checking to make sure that our initial probabilities match our old initial probabilities. And if they don't, I just keep going. Um, Okay, I'll try to explain once I finish this up so uh, anybody that doesn't have that question can keep going. So uh, if self does equal old, that means we've converged within whatever tolerance we've done. Converged equals true. And now once converged equals true happens, this while loop, where is it? This while loop breaks. That's our break condition or escape condition. And then I'm just going to give some feedback to the user saying prevent uh, print converged uh, after count iterations string. Okay, so with this in mind, let's go back to the exam and that sequence. Still have There's our fun sequence. And first, let's start our, our model. Model equals HMM and hidden states equal, well, maybe I'll show you guys this. I'm just gonna say HMM. And it's gonna yell at me saying hidden states must be provided, okay? I already know that, I already know that the alphabet's ACGT. So here I'm just gonna say hidden states equals GI. And I can create whatever seed I want. Seed equals 42, whatever. Um, so we can look at this model. And thanks to our cool formatting, everything's within a single uh, or two significant figures. But now we actually need to do the bomb welch on it. So I'm gonna say model dot bomb welch and remember, it takes a list of sequences. So I'm going to put that sequence within brackets. Okay. This is not the same. So I want to, I really want to point this out. This is not the same as this. Just so you guys know. This is shorthand for saying wrap whatever this is inside a list. This is saying break whatever's inside this thing into a list, okay? So don't make that mistake. So I'm gonna take that bomb welch and run it. Okay, where's my error? 
or not drink. Oh, there it is. Alan. And I didn't spell something right. Outer. There we go. Converged after 128 iterations. So the idea here is I'm going to say print... Uh, sequence and if my model uh, converged correctly not in some weird local minima local maxima issue uh, it should create a Viterbi sequence that matches what it's supposed to look like and if you look at this it actually doesn't look like it converged correctly and that's because of this seed. For some reason, this seed doesn't work. The random conditions applied to that seed don't work. Seed 42. So if we change that seed, is it doing this? Yeah, now it's not wanting to work. It's so the same stuff we're already doing here. Converge after 52 iterations. Now I do it. I must add a typo somewhere. So I'll put this legitimate code. This is, this is the code that I used for my notes that I did myself. It has a lot of commenting and everything like that. There must be a typo in my original implementation. There's not much change though. But you see that convergence actually get, we reach convergence very quickly. Um, it should not be over 100. Um, but when we look at this, if you actually look at the sequences where it's saying it's a CPG island, you see lots of CG, 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 and that, that, that's reflected right here. The likelihood of it being a C or G is so high in a CPG island versus A and T. And then here's the next CPG island that it recognizes, and it's the same thing. So we're expecting these kinds of conditions. And, uh, but, it, but that's the bomb welch. Now, to go back to what you were saying, Wayne, about uh, how does this not uh, erase where we're at at any given time? When you think of the Bomb Welch algorithm, we're saying this sequence, uh, we're saying, uh, sorry, when you create an HMM right here, and we start out with some randomness, uh, some random probabilities that we've already set up through the initialize random step. So our, prob our, our model already comes up, starts with some random probabilities. So then when we uh, expose our model to this sequence for the very first time with the bomb Welch, it's basing everything off of these random probabilities. Uh, and those random probabilities uh, affect how this forward and backward algorithm uh, compute the probabilities of that specific base at that specific position at that specific state. Uh, so that's like the snapshot. Now we're saying with the bomb Welch, we're saying that this model is not correct. It hasn't converged correctly yet. So we're saying based off of what our model is, we need to change something. So we create these uh, blank slates of the init, trans, and emit. And Based off of where our model currently stands, we create, like we update those probabilities. Like we've refined them. Like, oh, okay, uh, given the, our current snapshot, this is the sum of these. And then we, uh, we do the scaling step and everything. And it's always, again, based off of what we, were, what we see at this current time. Then we update, so that means that our model has changed uh, slightly. Those probabilities have changed uh, slightly uh, every single time to some extent or another. And when that happens, this init 
BW just starts with blank slates again, but again, it's just looking at these aren't erasing our current our previous progress because forward and backward repopulate, so to speak, our progress every time we run it again. Because remember, forward backward is always running off of our model's current probabilities. So yes, this looks like a bunch of blank pseudocode or pseudo counts. However, technically speaking, these are pseudo counts that are going to be adjusted or modified based off of what our model looks like at this moment. And then when we go through that, we calculate and update those models again, or update the model again, it gets a new snapshot. So then we create new blank slates and get a new snapshot from forward or backward, forward and backward. And then we update again, and we keep doing that until sooner or later it doesn't change. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. If it doesn't, feel free to talk to Alan or Ryan. <laughs> I've, I've sat there and bashed my head against the stats long enough that I just, I got to work and copy, so I'm happy. I'm just kind of wondering where my typo is. Oh, well. So, let's get on over into chat session and ask how you guys felt about everything that happened in this session. Is there anybody that feels like giving any feedback? At first, my office was like super cold. Like I have this little space heater underneath the desk and I had that blowing on me this whole time. And then uh, at some point, because of these gigantic lights that I just got, uh, because of these gigantic lights, uh, the office is now warm and I feel like I'm getting a suntan. So feels good. I had actually turn off the space heater in the middle of our session today. I know it's kind of late knowing that you guys are well past the exam and looking at the, or those of you that are in 529, um, and the next exam is just on the horizon. Uh, and to get this material now feels a little late, but hopefully it just kind of solidifies some of the concepts we've been doing up till now. Thankfully, the next exam doesn't cover any of the content we've already gone over in class. It's uh, non-overlapping uh, or non-cumulative. Cumulative. Okay, well, okay, so the only thing about the outer... The only thing about the outer inner sums, uh, if you're looking at the Durbin method, that's what you hear is the outer and inner sums. The uh, outer sum is saying, uh, what's the, the probability of that, uh, of that sequence, the sequence as a whole, what's the probability? The inner sums are the probabilities within the uh, initial probability matrix, and the uh, emission probability matrix, and the transition probability matrix. So we're taking those sums in and on, uh, among themselves. And then you apply that outer, outer sum of all of the probabilities of all the observed sequences to those inner sums. That's the only difference. Is the outer sums is keeping track of the probability of the sequences, while the inner sums are keeping track of the probabilities of state changes and emission changes. And then you just uh, apply one to the other. Okay. It is a huge time commitment. Uh, no, uh, I've implemented HMMs in three different programming languages. Uh, the first time was in R, the second time was in C++ which was super performant, by the way. And uh, now in Python, and I've done the Python way because I've been trying to find different ways, fun ways to test myself on how to do this. And I've done, I did the HMM like six different ways. And I'm at the point where I'm just, I could draw, I could do up a, an HMM from scratch, but there's no reason to. There are tremendous or tremendously accessible packages out there. Until recently, uh, there's a major library in Python called uh, Scikit-Learn. I'm sure many of you guys have probably heard about Scikit-Learn at this point. Well, Scikit-Learn uh, had a component of it for HMM specifically. 
However, just because of changes to their model and everything like that, they've recently uh, uh, booted out the HMM portion of Scikit-Learn, but not like mean. They're not like, they don't think it's a bad uh, a bad library at all. They just feel it's outside the scope of what they're trying to do. Uh, but it's still out there. It's called uh, HMM Learn. Uh, if somebody, let's see if I can find it real quick and maybe I can uh, put it up. Uh, let's put it in chat. Okay. So HMM Learn is implements HMM already using scikit-learn, scipy, and they've already done it like hyper-optimized for as far as Python can be, uh, uh, as far as Python can get. Uh, always use that. Always use that versus making it from scratch because smarter people than I have done this uh, and many eyes have been on that project. So, always use an existing library if it's from a reputable source. Like, uh, specifically what we'll talk about with clustering tomorrow, uh, there's ways that you can write up your own clustering al algorithm, and then there's ways that you can create your own classes to represent trees. But there's no, and there and there's ways for you to write your own functions or algorithms for uh, determining distances, like Hamming distance, Euclidean distance, and all that other stuff. You could write those all you want. But there are reputable sources out there, not some crazy guy that has three downloads on on GitHub, but like real life, uh, legit sources uh, like Scikit-Learn or major packages on PyPI, uh, SciPy. There's already tremendous wealth of information out there, and it's always better to use those packages because they're better maintained and they're uh, more resistant or more robust than anything we could write. And better optimized. And you'll see that explicitly if you come to tomorrow's uh, stream when we talk about clustering. I'm going to show you an alternative implementation of the UPGMA where we can calculate everything uh, that we did in class using existing packages in 17 lines of code to include plotting uh, plot, plotting the tree. In any case, I hope you find this as, in, uh, as interesting as I do. I know I was kind of lax on the virtual office hours, but grading exams is kind of tough work sometimes, and then some additional health-related stuff came up. Uh, but outside of that, I hope this was helpful, and I hope you guys have a fun time trying to digest all the information here. Um, be sure to click follow uh, uh, underneath the screen to get mentions about... Uh, to get mentions or get notified when I go live again, because maybe sometimes I may not get a canvas message out. Uh, follow me on Twitter at uh, better idiot, better underscore idiot. Uh, I send out notifications there as well. And uh, star some of my packages on GitHub, specifically the oh, open office hours ones, if you guys so choose. It just uh, makes it a little bit easier, a little bit more visible to other people. In any case, thank you for your time. This has been a long session, but uh, have a good night.